I've been waiting for him to come on. I've been getting a lot of messages for people to get this guy on. And I consider him a co-creator of the genre thrash metal. Please welcome on guitar, Gary Holt. What's up? Hello, Gary. Here on this beautiful sunny Saturday afternoon. <laughs> oh yeah, man. Life for all the people stuck in the snow. <laughs> Dude, how you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Like I was saying earlier, I'm trying to make this new phone work. <laughs> I hate it. Yeah, it's yeah. Simple. It's always been simple. This one's being an asshole, I don't know why. Would you get iPhone 12 or something? Yeah, you know, like my battery life is going on the other one, so decided to upgrade and now I'm kind of like not liking it. Yeah, by the time you're, you're used to that phone, there's gonna be a new one you gotta upgrade to. That's how yeah, it works. Probably, probably for sure. That's how I think Cavastani is still on the iPhone 5. <laughs> you know what? I liked my 6, but um, the earpiece kind of went. You had to use, you had to have it in speaker mode, you know, to like hear anything. And and I liked it. So I got this other one. I never liked it as much. And now I got this new one. And I don't like it as much as the 6. Man, iPhones, man. It, it's a, it's a, a necessary evil. Yeah, I know. I should have stuck with Androids. <laughs> yeah. Those are European phones, bro. Androids and stuff. Got to yeah, yeah. have the iPhone. Dude, I want to talk, the couple things I want to talk about with you is, uh, of course, we'll get to the new Exodus, but I want to start off with Slayer, um, your yeah. stint with Slayer. When did you get the call? You know, um, right after the first 70,000 tons of metal when we're all out there, you know, Carrie actually reached out to Bob Tyrell and said, tell Gary to call me when he gets to shore. And, uh, you know, we were out there tearing shit up. That was fucking fun. Yeah. The very <laughs> first one, we had a blast. I know what fun feels like and I know when I'm having it and I was having fun. And so I got, um, got home and I called him and he kind of filled me in on everything that was going on and I thought it was going to be like you know a few months maybe a couple of tours you know and I, yeah it sounds like something fun to do something outside the box for me you know and um it turned out to be almost nine years so dude nine years that's a that's, almost, a, yeah. that's a good run dude with Slayer you know, in nine years it started in February you know did dude did you um did you know all the songs I mean I, did no, you just go in and did you sit down with Carrie and learn them or I, I didn't know any of it. I knew like maybe one Slayer riff, you know, and uh, no disrespect. I wasn't one of those guys who knew all the songs by heart. I knew mo more of show no more mercy than any of the other stuff, you know, because back me and Bailoff, you know, we were listening to that shit when it, you know, first came out and you know, like the other stuff, I didn't have that super fan knowledge of where all the changes go where you could hum it before you could play it you know yeah i didn't know any of it wow, i like to learn all of it i had no idea and then i had to learn the slayer way of thinking you know i'd learn a riff but i'd learn it kind of how i would have written it and then you realize there's five million more notes and then <laughs> you thought <laughs> did did you sit down with carrie yeah. to go over the stuff i mean how was how was the jam session like when you first jammed with slayer First day I jammed, I played like 19 songs, I think. Wow. Learn them at home, you know, and like anytime I got to learn a song, the first thing I do is I don't pick up a guitar. I just listen to it for like a couple of weeks, you know, so I know where all the changes are and I know the song the same way some like fan would know the song. Not that I wasn't a fan, you know, but um, you have to like, you know, know all the parts. It doesn't do you any good to learn the a riff if you don't even know where it goes. Yeah, I know I what you're saying. I'd, I'd, it and I'd hear all the little things, then I'd sit and learn how to play. You know? Gotcha. Yeah, with me, it's like when if we have to pick out an old song in Death Angel from an older catalog, I'll just listen to it constantly. Then I'll just have Rob show me the riffs, and I got it. You know, yeah, because you know how it works, like, Yeah, you where know, you know all the parts go. You know, totally. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Other than Slayer, the only band you've been in, Exodus and War Dance. Yeah, right. The more right. Than, you know, three fourths were Exodus anyway. So. Yeah, it was you, Tom, yeah, and I'd, I'd never like been in another band in my life, you know, since I was seventeen, and that's why it was appealing because at the time of that Slayer called, I was planning on taking some time off. Like we've been going pretty hard for 
for like a few years straight and I wanted like a few months off and didn't turn out that way. <laughs> I ended up busy as fuck. That's a good thing. But when you, when you came into Slayer, I mean, was it, I mean, for lack of a better term, like, was it a, a culture shock having to come from Exodus being your main band, you're, you're the main shot caller, main songwriter and coming into Slayer as just the guitar player? No, I liked it. I liked it. You know, like, for one, there was way more guitar solos than I ever remembered in a Slayer set, especially on the the Jeff side of things, which those are the solos I was doing. There's tons. And, you know, I got to go on just like kind of evolve into the role of guitar hero, you know, like and just go out, do my thing, shred hella hard guitar over my head, do whatever the fuck I wanted. No one ever told me what to do or play like this or play like that, you know. And uh, it was fun. It was fun just to go out there and just fucking shred balls every night and make up a different solo every night, you know? Sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. <laughs> but, um, I mean, Jeff, unfortunately, you know, rest in peace, he's not here with us anymore. Um, did you get a lot of flack from the fans when you came in? I had two real hecklers the whole time I was in Slayer. And that's a pretty fucking good ratio, considering how many people I played for and how many shows and stuff. I had one guy, this guy with this, in Germany, of course, with some bald skull, and he was down in front just flipping me off the whole show. And I like, I nodded over at our production manager, uh, John Lafferty. I was like, "Get that motherfucker out of here!" <laughs> you know, he bailed though because he saw people on radios. Because I, you know, I'm a thick-skinned guy. But, you know, like, yeah, if you're just not even, why'd you even spend the money, motherfucker? Yeah. And then we did a show in Milan, and this was well into my time in Slayer. And I had a guy front row just talking shit to the point of, like, made me mad a little bit. Just because, you know, he was, like, right front row. And at the end of the show, I got, I hopped on the subwoofer, you know, the, the subwoofer, right up to him and, like, smiled at him and, like, you <laughs> We can continue this conversation right now. And he didn't have shit to say. You know, because I was, I was, he got me mad, didn't hurt my feelings, but like, let's uh, bring us a little closer together and have a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Because like, like yeah. he was aggressive about it. He was, fuck you, fuck you. And I'm like, you know, and I've been in the band for fucking five years at this time, at this point five six years maybe like you know the first one was on the first tour you know like and it wasn't near as bad and then i had other people fuck with me to where like flip them back and then at the end of the show we're like smiling like that you know just kind of playing with each other and that's yeah all. that's awesome man i mean I'm, I'm glad i mean two is better than a whole bunch you know what i mean yeah yeah i mean i, I can imagine some people would have got a whole bunch so yeah yeah now, when you stepped in, did you ever talk to Jeff during your time with Slayer before he passed? Yeah, yeah. He came down, it was there at a rehearsal once, you know, like I actually asked him a question about a lick. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and he was cool as fuck. You know, we never really had a conversation about me doing it, but at his memorial, you know, they read um, a letter that Catherine had written because she just, you know, it was too much, too raw for her to come. Yeah. And uh, she described when she told him that they were going to continue with somebody else. And and uh, she put it in the letter. He was super, super bummed and he hung his head down and was kind of really disappointed and sad. And then he said, who? And they said, Gary Holt. She said, Gary Holt. And then he smiled and said, fuck, yeah. So, you know, I had his full blessing, which is cool. You know, I mean, you know, we've known each other forever. We spent a lot of the early days fucking having having some good times yeah man you guys go way back like pre-show no mercy pretty much you know yeah yeah you know fucking he's missed you know i mean i i never wanted the gig it's his gig i would rather he'd still be here you know yeah didn't did it there's a story didn't uh jeff give you his upside down cross the one that he had behind the show no mercy yeah, yeah, the one on the back with the slide on it you know i had that thing for fucking years and it got lost in a move oh dude that's like a history you know like i had it into the 90s you know i knew where the fucking thing was you know it's like right there you know 
and um, vanished. You know. That's a metal. Uh, that's metal history right there. Come on, you know that sucked. Yeah, it'd be right on my wall. Of, obviously, if I had it. Yeah, I, dude, I talked to you one time on tour, and you know, I asked about learning Slayer songs. You, you told me like you had to unlearn what you learned to learn that stuff. Because they write very outside the box, you know, and I, I write more based on, you know, like fixed scales and shit like that. And, and, um, and the more I was able to like, uh, you know, change my way of thinking to how they wrote, the easier it got to learn this stuff because, you know, you know, I'd listen to a riff like, um, the fast part in rain and blood before the verse starts, you know, they're sitting there yeah. going, I didn't hear that. I just heard like, gull, 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 you know, like there's fucking so many notes in there. It's almost in not humanly possible to hear them all, but they're there. And once you get used to that, you know, you, you start playing more like that, you know, and you start um, learning this stuff a lot easier because you kind of figuring out how Jeff would have written it, you know, or, or Carrie too. So um, what, is your favorite Slayer song to play live? Hello Eights. Hello Eights? Hello Eights. Yeah. Especially with the fire, huh? Fire, yeah. <laughs> Before the fire, I, I love that song. I love that record, you know? And I love playing the Show No Mercy stuff a lot, you know, fucking Antichrist and Black Magic and stuff. That stuff was fun for me. What was the hardest Slayer song to play? Uh, the hardest Slayer song to play? Fucking kind of like one no one would think of is a world painted blood really it's an opening song of the set you know and you're coming out and you're just and then the verse and you're doing that for open riff verse chorus verse chorus again before you even get to slow your right hand down you know, like it's it's a workout it's physical as fuck wow man how about the slayer song you wish it, that wasn't on the set <laughs> oh, you gonna make me do that yeah um, well your, I, le your least favorite slayer song you know it's funny because some of them aren't my least favorite but i my least favorite tuning was playing the b tuning stuff you know oh. Okay. Me. It's loose. It's a little slot. A little too loose for me. And um, but I love playing payback, and that's in drop B. That is fuck. But the guitar never felt like right to me. You know? Dude, but playing with all that pyro, dude, that must have been challenging. Challenging, but challenging to stop smiling. But smiling about it. But you, you, you must have had cues or you must have had like pre-production meaning like on this song, don't go here, yeah, don't go there. Gone, yeah. Wow, dude. I mean, I've seen you guys at Pyro. It's in, intense, but I'd be afraid to go it's up there. It's out play. of hand, man. Especially when we added the downstage Pyro. You know, um, you know that's where uh, they added that shit and I just about got my eyebrows cooked off a couple times. Dude. Dude, you were sweating every night too. You no, know, actually, you don't sweat that much because it it's such a dry heat. Sometimes, you know, it like bakes the wet off you. You know, like walk up stage, you're not that wet. It's like having a dryer out there. But you know, I never got to see the last tour, the the final tour because we were on tour. But I saw photos. Man, that you guys uh, went out with a bang. You guys went out with a bang. It was phenomenal. You know, like. Glad to have been a part of it. Here's one thing. You got to jam with Dave and Paul. Incredible drummers, man. What, yeah. I know different styles, but what was it like? I mean, of course, you have history with Paul. He played in Exodus. Yeah, you know, I've had the history with Paul, you know, like you said, in Exodus and just knowing him from the whole Bay Area. But I've known Dave forever, and they're both two wildly different drummers, you know. Paul's like this fucking thrash metal machine just you know powering through shit and just super pummeling and heavy power and dave like improvises a lot for better or worse you know just like i do on solos you know and um me and dave would be watching some video of like tito puentes you know backstage and then i go up to him rocking out and all of a sudden he does that same fill 
that we saw in this Latin jazz ensemble. He's up there fucking, oh, what were we like? and we're laughing, you know, but you know, I'm blessed to play with some pretty badass drummers in my life, you know? Yeah, dude. I mean, yeah, I mean, fuck. Dave, Tom, Tom Hunting. Hey. Tom Hunting, we you can't forget Tom Hunting, man. He has he a on a new album. He, like, he um he's put other motherfuckers on notice. <laughs> can't wait to hear it. But so so you, be, you being in Slayer nine years, I'm pretty sure because someone, and I was gonna ask this question, but someone brought it up in the chat. Tom Nixon, do you think your time in Slayer has influenced some of the new Exodus material? I don't think so. I think when you hear the new Exodus, you know, anybody that says, oh, I bet it sounds like Slayer. No, it don't sound like Slayer. It sounds like Exodus. And, um, you know, I mean, but I learned a lot, you know, I mean, when you go from one band and then you go to a band and you're like, at some points in your nine years, you're playing arenas and shit. You learn a lot. You learn a lot about the behind the scenes elements and all that kind of shit. And, you know, it was really good for my chops. That's for sure, you know, playing that kind of high speed shit and, you know, soloing wise. And like I said, I'm making shit up half the time. And, uh, yeah, they, so they, you never, they never told you you got to learn Jeff stuff. They let you do a free for all. Not once, no. I mean, if, you, if they wanted someone to play just like Jeff, which is, you know, one of a kind style, you know, you, you would have been way better going out and getting some guy from a Slayer tribute band who has spent his every waking moment learning how to play like Jeff, you know, like we're totally two different guitar players that live in the same genre, you know? Yeah. And uh, they just let me go out and do my thing and, and go crazy. You know? That's awesome, dude. I mean, you know, like, I tried to mimic the vibe, you know, like, yeah, Jeff was playing fast or using whammy bar. I tried to do it too, you know, on show no mercy. There's a lot of melody in his solo. So I tried to like mimic some of his, key licks and stuff in the solos yeah you just like you know, in the beginning run online like gary hold sucked he doesn't even try to play jeff solos <laughs> yeah I, I know what you mean i mean like like you said show the mercy has melody you'll start off like the first bar and you'll go off on your own type deal yeah you know fill, fill in the blanks you know in the little transitional periods and stuff like that wow dude but yeah man it, it it's really cool that I mean, there's always been arguments about how Exodus should have been in the big four. And I agree. I think if you took sales away, I think Exodus should have been up there. But I think you did represent Exodus by being in Slayer. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's shown a, a brighter light on the band and myself, you know. And uh, a lot of good came from it. And I had a lot of fun, you know, I mean. Those guys are my other family for sure and uh, always will be. But uh, the new Exodus album is on a whole nother level. <laughs> well, I can't wait to get I that one. I've been laughing because it is insane. The record label all just got it and they've collectively all like Jeez. exploded fucking in joy right out their assholes. They just shit their fucking pants. <laughs> well, I wouldn't expect anything less from Exodus, you know. It, Come on. I mean, yeah, I'm proud of all the albums we've done. Yeah, but um, I'm not sick of listening to this one yet. Usually, by the time an album's mixed, I've heard it so many times, I don't want to listen to it anymore. Yeah, yeah. Now, before we get to the new Exodus record, you know, let's answer a couple of uh, let's check out a couple of fan submitted video questions, Gary. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do let's, it. Let's do it. You ready? Yeah, yeah. Check this out. Ah, Manny. <laughs> What's up, Metal Brothers? Ted, Gary, let's say you're on Bass Strikes Back Part 2. You get to switch bands for one song. Gary, which song of Death Angels would you play? And Ted, which song of Exodus would you play? Uh, if, I, if I could switch, um, that's a hard one because, you know, you might want to go like, old school you know um yeah i want to say thrown to the wolves i love that song dang, you love dang, 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 dang. It's okay. dude yeah I, I love playing that song too the exodus songs two of them i like blacklist because that's just a driving tune man it just gets the crowd pump in it's has some cool gang vocals and uh uh till death do us part of pleasures yeah we should put that one back in the set I like playing that song. I, 
I think you should put that in the set, dude. Yeah. And you should put Ray's on the set. Ray's, um, I don't come think on, bro. We have to talk <laughs> about that one. Um, I mean, we've done it before. It's just uh, sometimes, you know, we got so many fast stuff, but you know, till death to a spark, that should definitely be in there. Yeah, I think you should, because I think pleasures gets overlooked a little bit. Oh, totally my opinion. Sure. You know. I, I think so too. Yeah. Hey, check out this uh, other fan question, Gary. Ready, my man? Oh, yep. shit. Look at this, dude. Oh, no. Hey, my question for Gary is I saw a interview that you did with ESPN Guitars. And uh, you said that your guitar with the crimson and cream finish was a tribute to OU. And that just blew us away. We had no idea there was a story or a connection there. Not common knowledge with us Oki metalheads. So please elaborate on that. Who's your favorite OU player? Oh, and a shout out to Death Angel. You guys play Tulsa every time you go on tour. And this town loves you guys. So anyway, Boomer Sooner. <laughs> all right my love of all things OU is it's it, it's fucking genetic my father born and raised in Asher Oklahoma I was raised with Sooner football playing in the house and I had the white and red guitar and I bought an OU sticker and I put on it and I buried it with my father and I had another one made and and so that's just been one of my college teams, you know, because my, my father, you know, like um, the California boy in me is a Cal Bears fan. You know? so, but um, I'll always sport the OU flag. I haven't hung mine back up on the ceiling yet. Oh, yeah, I have. It's right above me. Hold on. I've, I'm still working on my office. There, hold on. there he goes. Yeah, it's up there. Boomer sooner, baby. Yeah. No. Pops, you know, you I mean, know was like when Rick Hunolt joined Exodus, when he first we first met, he thought I was from the South. The way I talked, he's like, "Who is this motherfucker from like Alabama with this heavy ass guitar tone?" <laughs> That's <laughs> years later, and like I'm from fucking California, born and raised, but I talked a little bit like my father, I think, and so I had like this hybrid accent, accent, you know, a little California, a little Oklahoma. I called it a Okafornian. Yeah. Crazy. Gary, let's get to the new Exodus. When did the writing process start for this record? Years ago. I mean, some of it. You know, whenever I'm writing for a record, I'll write like thousands of riffs and some of them are great and they don't get used at all because I get bored and I've moved on to other riffs, you know, like uh, I have scores in my phone and um but, you know, I had a bunch of stuff and then Tom and I in the summer got together up in the mountains and we really started like putting it together. And uh, some of the best shit on the record was written on the, at the last minute. Like um, some was like written, at, finished as I was doing a scratch track for Tom. I was making the parts up as the click rolled by, like fucking think fast, Holt, here it comes, you know, like, and just literally like creating on the fly. And it was killer because it, forces you to think on your feet you know just like spontaneous riffage you know just out of nowhere I mean, like cool it's a couple songs like that are you an old school guy where you need to get in a room with tom and here's some i wrote a song let's check it out or do you, do you have a pro tool set up where you write and you send a file to tom you know I, I i write some stuff in like garage band you know but mostly it's old school i need to get in a room with tom there's um one song in particular on the album that's one of my favorites and it was entirely written but the arrangement was different in garage band and i'd forgotten all about it we just kind of wrote it off and then we we're like let's revisit that let's listen to that and we threw it into the pro tools rig and then i was like wait let's take this part and let's move it and we actually arranged it based off all everything i recorded we just like created the gaps and the the new parts we wanted and Tom tracked it to full guitars and bass and harmonies and everything. And then I redid all the guitars. And it's fucking quite possibly the heaviest Exodus song has ever been written. Oh, man. It's fucking oh. mammoth. It's, <laughs> it's just Godzilla stomping Tokyo. It's so heavy. Well, all Exodus songs are heavy, well, man, in their own right. Oh, it's crushing slow. Uh, it's like Godzilla. He doesn't move fast. He moves slow, you know? 
Yeah. Oh, shit, that's a velociraptor on your ass. You know, this shit's like just like more than gargantuous. But um, when you were writing with Tom, I know you wrote it up in the mountains. You took several trips back and forth, or did you, was it one whole session? I mean, I come home every now and then, you know, but man, I was up there from probably some point in May to October, you know, like I'd come home for weekends here and there and, and stuff like that. But we just, we started and it was blazing hot and we we're like sweating the soap, like stayed soap at the end of the day of jamming and we ended, it was freezing. That's how long we were up there. Wow, hot dude. And cold and, um, and uh, we shipped in like an entire studio, not like your usual, I got my little Mac and a little screen and my portable Pro, Pro Tools rig. The Goody went crazy. He has a lot of shit. We trucked it all in. Damn, you brought you just brought it all, huh? We had like studio A, B, and C. You know, we had two drum sets set up. And the real big difference on this album is the drums were ready to go the entire recording process. It's not like you like you do drums and then they're finished, tear them down, mics are all packed away, and you start on guitars. And Tom would come in two months, you know, at the after a song is recorded, like, wait, I want to redo this part. And the drums are set up, go do it. And then he had the second kit that we'd write on and do like pre-production demos so that we weren't beating up the heads on the other one. And then Jack had a little studio set up at the rental house. So, you know, it was like phenomenal. And we don't like recording in studios. We have not done an album in a real studio in, since Force of Habit. You know, we, we'll do drums there because you need more microphones and inputs, but Steve had all that shit. But we like rent homes and build studios in them. We rent like vacant buildings and build studios because we don't want to commute. We want to like, it's, it's, heavy metal summer camp for us you know we like we get together and we fucking riff out and we whoever's not recording is man in the grill and we fucking when we're done we're drinking beer and hanging out outside and it's like bonding we love it and it's kept this band fucking fresh and happy you know i, I talked to zetro about that he said that's the first time exodus has been together recording since tempo like everyone and in one Tempo, room. He didn't, we lived out there, but Zet would commute back and forth. So this is his first time living amongst the record. You know, it's like a wild animal and you're like living there with it, you know. And, uh, but we've done that and we did it with Rob, you know. No, wait, I, I correct myself. We did do Shovelheaded Kill Machine in the studio because Andy wasn't available and stuff. But uh, both the exhibit albums we did, built our own studios. Uh, Blood in, Blood out. We built on the goat ranch where Tom has a house, and this one we did in Lake Almanac. Nice. Are there any guest guitar players on the Exodus album? Rick Hunolt and Craig and Loon both do a solo. Oh, your 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 stunt double. Yeah, for... my stunt double. He does like probably the best solo on the whole fucking album. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm listening to that and like I'm glad that falls under the the. The realm of Lee will have to learn that live, not me. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's right. Yeah, speaking yeah. of Craig, and he he's done a fantastic job filling in for you when you were out with Slayer. Yeah, he's amazing. Such yeah. a phenomenal musician, you know. He's part of our management team now too, you know. So um, if he's not working behind the scenes on that stuff, you know, he's been filling in for me. You know, you know. Hopefully, I won't need any more stunt doubles. <laughs> Well, you know, we'll as long as I don't slam my fingers in any more doors like a dumb fuck I did. But you know, Slayer's retired now. You can go full on Exodus. You know, oh, I love it. Love it. Yeah. So I mean, the COVID tour we did together was some of the most fun I ever had. I thought I was gonna die in a shipwreck and got strip searched by border guards in, in uh, Switzerland. <laughs> I think it was Switzerland or Sweden. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I still had the most fun I ever did. It was fun, and we and were supposed, to, and we were supposed to continue it till the lockdown happened, which sucks, you know. Yeah, yeah. It would have been, but something that to look forward to that. Yeah, something to look forward to. But I'm glad. Unfortunately, unfortunately, two shows got canceled. You know what I mean? But we're lucky. If the tour had started two weeks later, we'd have lost two weeks of tours. 
Oh yeah, I think we started at the good time, at the right time. It was cold, but we had a good time, man. It was fun. It was fun, man. All right, let's uh, let's songs again. It was awesome. Let's yeah, let's check out another fan question for Mr. Gary Holt here. Check this out, brother. Hi, Gary. Hi, Ted. My name is Timmy. I'm from Sweden, and my question for you, Gary, is: Would you ever consider reusing the "Impact Is Imminent" riff in a new, different song? Stay safe, rock on. Would I use? Where'd you go, Chad? There you go. We use, you know, no. <laughs> um, although Impact is Imminent as a record has some of my favorite riffs I've ever written in my life, and I've always said I wish I, um, I wish I'd never released it because then I could reuse them as new. Because that's my favorite riff I ever wrote is the riff to Impact is Imminent. Without a doubt, things string skipping all over the place. Nobody was doing that shit then. Riff is fucking crushing. It's hard to play. But no, I'm not going to reuse it. Maybe I'll play it sometime. Why don't you throw that back in the set or something, bro? We've talked about putting at least something from Impact in there and Force of Habit. It's great stuff. I don't know why I ignore it. You know, it's not like it's our Saint Anger. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's still great songs on this shit, you know? But you know, you have a, 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 a nice, Exodus has a nice catalog. It must be hard to pick out a set list. It's hella hard because, of course, everybody wants to hear the Bonded by Blood stuff and they want to hear Fabulous Disaster and Toxic Waltz, of course. And um, by the time you've figured out and set aside, you know, like six must play songs, Blacklist is, you know, every bit of as much of a requirement as Bonded by Blood. And um, by the time you're done with those, it's only leaving you with about a, maybe, you know, another six, seven songs. And we're proud of our fucking new albums. I want to play this shit, you know, and it gets really tough because we're not making new albums just to like find one song that people want to play. We want to play all of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. Like we have that same problem too. Like you have a new album. You go, How about fucking solid fat ass shit. And you yeah. Right on. And just like when we look at it, you know, sometimes you have to skip an album. It sucks. I want to touch on everything, but it's yeah, impossible. Yeah. You want to, you know, but the music's brutal. People can't, st they can't sit around and, and take two hours of Exodus. It's too much. You know, that's why Slayer didn't play, you know, two hour fucking shows or evening with shit because it's just too heavy. You know, like there's no like, four song acoustic interlude to break it up you know yeah. <laughs> it's like we're gonna be two two and a half hours of fucking hammers to the head <laughs> you just can't do it i mean 90 minutes of slayer is good and you guys always did exactly 90 minutes at per night on the dot yeah you guys had that dial yeah. dial dial <laughs> all right man. let's let's go to another video question here damn gary you're famous dude you're famous hi ted Hi, Gary. Here's Alex Thrasher, all the way from the Netherlands. Of course, Bonded by Blood is considered one of the best thrash albums ever made. I think this album deserves a tribute. How about a re-recording? And every great Bay Area thrash band will play a song from that album, like Violence playing a lesson in violence, Testament playing, uh, of course, Exodus. Uh, and the opening song could be played by Metallica, Bonded by Blood. They started it all, right? And the final song, Strike of the Beast. There's only one band who could make that happen, right? That's the Mighty Slayer. That's the Mighty Slayer. With Gary on guitar and Carrie King on guitar, of course. You can make it happen, Gary, please. Is it possible? Let me know. Uh, he gives me way too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> it happened. Okay, Metallica, cover an Exodus song right now, suckers. <laughs> hey, it's possible they covered a Fate song. Yeah, I know, but yeah, it's just, it is what it is. I mean, when we re-recorded Bonded by Blood, my original idea was I didn't want to re-record it myself. I wanted other people to do the songs. I had like a short list of people that I thought would have been killer, but those kind of things never happened. And I wanted to pay tribute to Paul, you know, and um, so we did it ourselves. You know, some people hated it, some people love it. I mean, I remember talking to Abbott and, and he was like, I want to do Metal Command, you know, like... I kind of had a short list of people I thought like fucking, you know, I was thinking outside thrash. I thought Dimmu Borger could do a killer no love, you know, 
it's been rad, you know. But um, you know, I don't know. This guy's got it all figured out. I'm gonna let him handle it. <laughs> you gotta but, yeah, you know, let him let, let, brother. <laughs> yeah, let him let him get a hold of Chuck and them and like Sean yeah, Killian them. Get a hold of Chuck and you and violence. You know, yeah, get Metallica. Well, I can call Kirk, but you know, that ain't gonna get me anywhere. <laughs> one thing I want to bring up, just to go back a little bit, uh, there's one show I wish I would have saw Exodus, and I was too young. You know, moms wouldn't let me out of the house. New Year's Eve at the Bill Graham with Metallica. I, I heard, I heard, and stories. I mean, it could be a rumor, it could be a story, but you guys crushed Metallica. We crushed Metallica, dude, and and you know, like, look, you know, I'm not gloating. We crushed them, and they knew it. Is their big homecoming? They just finished recording Master of Puppets and we came out, we had more amps. We had a bigger riser. We just looked, we came out looking like a headliner. And uh, we were partying hard after and James comes up and we're just getting wasted. And he goes, that'd be the last time you guys opened for us. And it was. Again. <laughs> 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 I guess nah. it would have sucked a little bit. Uh, we never played with Metallica again until in the recent decade. And that was like festivals somewhere, you know? Wow, wow. But I mean, you still get along with all of them, right? Well, I love them to death. And I have their, I'll always support them and always give them all credit where credit's due. I consider Master of Puppets the greatest metal album ever made. Not just I agree. Metal. I think it, nobody's ever come up with anything closer. Maybe closer would be Judas Priest stained class. You know, um, but uh, I give them all respect. Even with St. Anger, I always said, you know, if they made it sound right, it wouldn't be so bad, you know? That's true. That's true. I mean, it, it, the on YouTube, some guy re recorded the whole album, but did it with like proper drum sound and guitar sound, and the songs are killer. And just add some solos in there. They put some solos in it, like Kirk Shred. You know, yeah. and I've never listened to Lulu because I don't want it to sully my, my opinion of a band I admire so much. <laughs> On that note of it. On that subject, uh, Kirk showed you your, you know, he taught you a little bit on guitar. Showed you a first chord or something, right? He showed me my first lick, you know, little, 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 and you know the basics, building blocks, and he showed me my first chords and taught me how to play some songs and stuff. And I wouldn't be doing this today if it wasn't for Kirk. Maybe you know, I, I don't know. But I, I heard I, too. I, I found mean, my way to a guitar at some point, but you know, like we hit it off and became fast friends right away. And um, he's like, you know, let me show you some guitar. And six months later, I was in the band. See, six months later, it's like I heard you left. Six months later, you came back and you were inveying out. No, no, no. Six months, I was playing <laughs> competent solos. In a year, I was playing really good solos. You know, um. You know, I was still, you know, they rehearsed in my garage and then they moved to a friend's house and I was still part of the road crew, roadies, you know, we moved 212 combos and drank beer and pillaged and wrecked shit, you know. And um, at rehearsal one day, he hands me his guitar and uh, here, play something. And we played Grinder, Judas Priest. And uh, and then they asked me to join. And I said, fuck yeah, you know, changed my life forever. You know, that song, yeah, man. that song is dear to my heart, you know, always will be. Would you consider Metallica a Bay Area band or more of an LA band? Bay Area band. They had no home there. They were not wanted. <laughs> they were outcasts from Southern California, and they came and found a home up up here. You know, so they're Bay Area band. Okay. LA did not get to take credit for Metallica. So. Okay. You heard it from the man himself. There's always a debate about that. To call them your band. I'm sorry. And there's always a debate about that. That's why. So I thought I'd ask the guy who's been there from the from the get go. Yeah, and they moved up here because this is where fucking the scene was. There was no real, they you know, it was a hair band scene down there. They come up here and found you know like minded fools like Exodus and Death Angel and found Rampage Radio and and all these people and Brian Lou and Ron Quintana and Ian Kalen and and Rich Birch and fucking the whole scene you know and everybody embraced them and they came over and found people listening to the same music they were into the same shit and um and they knew they had to live here you know that makes you a bay area band not an la band 
<laughs> okay, well, good. Now that we is an LA band, Slayer kicked fucking ass. So LA, you get the claim Slayer, all right? Just let it be enough for you. Came Slayer and Megadeth. Yeah, you get the yeah. claim Megadeth and Slayer. You guys have got a pretty good track record. You just don't get that one. Yeah, we got Metallica <laughs> and Exodus. Um, what, I mean, of course, a lot of people, you get a lot of this on the tour, fucking Exodus, big influence. Who is the one person that shocked you to find out that they were a huge Exodus fan? Oh, God, that's a hard question. I don't know. Outside of like thrash metal? In general. Like it could be outside, yeah, sure. I don't, I, I don't know. Is there anybody? Of course. <laughs> I mean, I've seen people have a shock they're wearing an Exodus shirt, but that doesn't mean you're a fucking fan, you know, like, you know, I, I mean, they saw a picture of Eddie Vedder wearing an old school, like, uh, Slay Team shirt. Maybe he's a fan, you know, he's old enough. I don't know. I've never met the guy, cat, you know. How about these, um, do you trip off on these young cats, say like My Chemical Romance, are they into like Exodus as well? Frank, Frank is totally, you know, he fucking blacklist like his jam, he loves that. And, uh, you know, and he, awesome. I'm a huge fan of his too. So, you know, he's a cool motherfucker too. Dude, the name of the new Exodus album, I, it slips my mind, what's it called? Persona Non Grata. Where did that title come from? You know, it's just a term for, you know, like that the person who's been outcast, tossed aside, you know, or rejected. And uh, the album, you know, covers a, a lot of political bases without picking a side. It's kind of crazy, you know, people on both sides probably think it's in favor of them. I don't know. You know, um, not that I'm playing both sides of the fence, but um, the album's fucking crushing it's so good and lyrically it's great and at times it's a you know deadly serious and you know it's at times there's a little bit of sense of humor on it not much it's a pretty dark record did you write all the lyrics on this one no tom hunting wrote one actually wow and, uh zetra wrote two and i wrote nine nine damn dude that you are a busy cat writing riffs arranging riffs and writing lyrics you know, when we're in the studio like that, you know, at the end of the evening when we cook some dinner and we're done tracking, I go in the room and I like to, I just start writing there. And I usually write in the morning, like before anybody's awake when it's really quiet. And they'll wake up and I got the song done. You know, I went to bed with no song done. And the song Tom wrote is great, but it took him probably a couple of years from start <laughs> to finish. <laughs> but it's fucking fantastic, you know. So is, when you guys record, is it always like drums? Do you lay down the scratch tracks, then it's Tom, then you go back and do the real guitars? Yeah, yeah. But like having two kits set up, sometimes um, we do the pre-production demos, I guess you call, just yeah. to like, you know, work shit out and we play it together. And the, then I'd go and I'd, I'd do a scratch track and um, on, you know, support, like a, once we get the tempos where we want them. And then Tom would go and lay down drums and, you know, I'd do all the guitars. We'd get the bass in there. But like I said, Tom would have the ability to go back in and, and redo drums anytime we wanted. Damn, you have it nicely set up, huh? It was fucking yeah. rad. I'll, I'll never go back. Never I'm go back. There. I'm stuck that way from now on, you know. Is drums, that your main studio you know, now? Why does a drummer get like five, seven days? And, I, you know, some people are going, what? You know, this band spent five months doing drums. Tom usually does an entire album and bonus tracks in like five to seven days. But why is that? Why is a drummer getting short chains and, and he can't like work and, and continue through the course of the record? And that's because of costs. If you're in a regular recording studio and you're, you're booking it and you're leaving the drums set up every day, that means you got the studio locked out for like months. And that's yeah. like old school 1990s money. But, you know, and I make better sounding albums now for a, a tenth the cost, you know. Yeah, technology yeah, and, you yeah, know. Technology, you know. And plus, you know, you, you've been pretty, you, you've been there from the beginning, from Bonded by Blood. Now you know the studio, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I, know, I know what I want. The crazy thing about this album is a, a first for me, and I don't know if anybody, if any other guitar player has ever done this, they can let me know. 
from the rehearsal point of me and Tom to pre-production and that when I actually mic'd my rig up and started guitars, I did not touch a single knob on the amps or nothing. Really? It's yes, the same it's setting? Older. We, we experimented with microphones. That's all we did. I didn't like, oh, I got to mess with the low end. I got to do this, add more gain, less gain. It was perfect fucking from the plug-in. It was like those Marshalls were so good. Dude, Marshall man, man. I'm, I'm surprised you didn't use a Kemper on this one. No, no, no. You gotta get, gotta go full, full tubes, you know? I still love the Kemper. I use it live all the time, but I run mine into like Marshall heads, you know? So I'm getting that full Marshall power amp section and like, you know, it sounds like an amp. Now with, with Slater, I'm gonna go back to Slater. You had to use Jeff's rig. You couldn't use your own rig, right? No, I could have used whatever I wanted. It's just Jeff's was what was there at first. Like uh, our, my first shows was um, Soundways in Australia and I managed their range to have a little stage time so I could play with it a little bit. It was very clean compared to what I'm used to, you know? And over the years, you know, I went through various different Marshall apps, you know, until I finally got the Jubilees in there and was truly like happy. Wow, man. Yeah, I mean, you you had good tone in Slayer. It's your right hand. You know what I mean? You know, it's your people, right hand. People play my amp rig and it doesn't sound like me. You know, playing it with everything the same. Hand hand the guitar, it just doesn't sound the same. You know, because everybody plays differently. Yeah, but your rig, I got to play your rig on the bass tracks back to her. You are a loud as fuck, motherfucker, dude. <laughs> you are loud. That's you know? not. Rob's pretty fucking loud too. No, no, no. You're louder than both me and Rob combined, dude. I've been up there. Well, you know, maybe it's those years in Slayer. I mean, on that tour, the bass strikes back. I was just running one amp, two cabs, you know, like running six cabs and three amps with Slayer and monitors. <laughs> now, let me ask you, what was your favorite show in Slayer? The show where you go, yes, that was my favorite. The final one. The final one, huh? The very Final last show. one? Yeah, you know, like, you know, in the, the last time I ever played Angel of Death when I did the big whammy bar hang, you know, but I just, I was fighting back tears on that one, you know, and I just, I kind of like did that and I just waved, kind of like said bye. And, and then I took that guitar backstage and everybody signed it and it's in storage right now, but it'll be on my wall soon, yeah. Yeah, man, yeah. I saw photos from that tour, man. Everyone was there, everyone had tears and you guys crushed from what i heard yeah it was fucking amazing you know and when we hit the one year anniversary we had a little moment like you know because we all kind of went our own ways and you know i like, talked to paul a little bit and everyone now and then me and carrie tex and a couple from tom but it wasn't until like the one year mark that started like you know like feeling a little bit nostalgic and appreciative of each other you know not yeah. that it weren't but you know kind of like you know Kerry reached out and said some really nice things to me you know and you know things that he didn't have to say I already knew it you know he's my brother but um you know I think we're all feeling a little nostalgic on that day no of course you know like you said it's a year you had time to kind of process and you know think about what's going on yeah yeah you know it doesn't hurt too with COVID happening that's all you could do is think <laughs> and try to stay healthy at the same time and mm -hmm. locked up. Yeah. So um, I was going to ask you, is there anything you learned from Slayer, not musically, but on production business and that you're going to bring into test, uh, Exodus? A million things, but you know, if I could get these dummies to like fucking throw up a little bit, <laughs> you know, um, I'd certainly learn how, how, a big ship sails, you know, how things work and behind the scenes and all that, you know, you learn a lot, you know, it's really like supreme knowledge, you know, to have. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I've seen it. Everything's run on time. Everything is like from, from the day, from the time the crew wakes up till they go to sleep, everything's and that's so uniform. Considering how much weed that crew smokes, that shit runs on time. Why is it that my own stoners <laughs> that, that I work with can't do anything on time? And Warren Lee and those guys are just on it and they're high as fuck. <laughs> totally, man. I mean, you had a good crew. Not, 
the crew itself from your sound man the lights everything it was just run so uniform it, it's really impressive yeah you know? right. you have the yeah. shit together for sure total shit together but gary here's another one for you babe give yep. me a minute here yeah hey ted hey gary Ted, thanks for doing these. Keep me up and keeping us sane during these crazy times. Uh, Gary, meant to ask you this at the garage sale, and I totally spaced it. Uh, how did you end up on Top Chef Masters, and was the food really that good? Thanks. All right. How did I end up on Top Chef Masters? Uh, Maria Ferraro set it up. So you want to be on it with Scott and Rob Zombie? Sure. Fuck yeah. It was fun. It was it was good. Wolfgang Puck was cool as fuck, and uh. The food was awesome. And I, you know, I'm, I'm not a vegan now. I went through a vegan period and it, that wasn't then. And the food was amazing. And I do eat a lot more vegan stuff now from time to time. But, you know, I've, I'm kind of like straddling the fence on that these days. But uh, yeah, it was fun. It was a good time. Dude, I didn't know you were on Top Chef. Yeah, Top Chef Masters uh, Rock Edition. I got to look that up. You were on it along with who? You said Rob Zombie? And Rob Zombie. Wow. And one, was... one thing they didn't show, like on the episode, you kind of see a quick toast, but it was when um, one of the contestants was bringing out a dessert and I uh, had some Sambuca and, and uh, put a little on top and they were walking away. And I said, whoa, whoa, bring that back. That was me. I said, bring that back. Come on, I'm drinking that shit. And so we all like pounded it down. But they just kind of like cut to a little of us like clinking, but. That was me calling the alcohol back. Jesus. <laughs> Gary, there's so I, I know your influences stem back from like the old days, but is there any um, new, new guitar players that you like, like younger cats, that you think like, holy shit, these motherfuckers? <laughs> um, there's a million. You look on Instagram, there's all these kids that are just shredding and doing crazy shit and like, and I see guys like the dudes from Periphery, the shit they're able to do on guitar is just phenomenal. It's like stuff that I'm too old and set in my ways to even think about learning. And, uh, but you know me, I gravitate towards the crunchy guys, you know, fucking Blake and Nick from Power Trip and fucking, you know, my, all, all my boys in Municipal Waste and stuff. That's what I want. I want yeah. to listen to guys go, you know. You like you're like you're like you love riffs, huh? I love riffs. You know, it's like if someone said, "What you can only do one? What are you going to be? Rhythm guitar player or lead guitar player?" I'm giving up lead in a second. I'm not even going to think twice about it. Done. Like the riffs, huh? <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm I'm a big riff fan too, too. You know what I mean? Yeah, but you know, like, Gary, you can no longer you can have the world's best lead tone and a shitty rhythm tone, the world's best rhythm and this horrible lead tone and you can't play lead anymore i'm gonna take the rhythm fuck it simple because <laughs> you could write songs with riffs <laughs> yeah, yeah you can't write songs with solos unless you want to do some instrumental shred record you know that's not maybe someday i don't know but um i'm all about the riff um excluding bonded by blood what would be your next favorite exodus record the new one the new one mm. Without a doubt. Without I a doubt. Consider that I'm still learning lessons. I'm 56 and I'm still figuring this shit out as I go along. And um, that's where I'm just staying at such a high level of fucking intensity and and uh, energy, you know, and the I'm I'm still learning and figuring out how to do this. And uh, the new album, I think we really put it together. Well, I can't wait to hear the record. But before we close off this uh, episode, I always ask my guests, I have the deep dozen or dirty dozen, however you want to call it. I got 12 questions. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, okay. Mild or spicy? Spicy. Have you gone too far with spicy? Oh, many times. <laughs> Anybody who knows me closely knows I get the hiccups from hot food. And uh, I'm like the heat barometer in Exodus. If I start hiccuping, everybody, oh, shit's hot. Gary's over there. Hip, hip, hip. <laughs> What's the hottest you had? I don't I, I went in, in LA and went to an Indian restaurant once and they made my food so fucking hot. I thought I was going to like, like my chest was going to collapse from hiccuping. It was pretty hot. 
Oh, dogs I've are cat. Eating Lee's food, which is what. Oh, dude, I've seen Lee eat like some we both crazy have stuff over in the bus fridge, and Jack ate mine one day because Lee said you can have mine, and then Jack took the wrong one, so I went to get mine, and like, fucking, not even edible. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I've seen Lee eat some hot stuff. I wouldn't touch it. Yeah, no yeah. Way. Nobody can hang, hang. I've seen people pretend that they can step up to that throne, but Lee eats that shit without even blinking. Yeah, he has, uh, he, he, he's uh, an alien. <laughs> he's an alien. It's like uh, in that, what's the movie um, uh, where the aliens, uh, they get drunk on sour milk? Um, no man, somebody. Well, they they've integrated in <laughs> into America into the world, and so there's like cops and and you know like it's a cop team, and one's a human, one's an alien. And um, was it uh, was that with Will Smith and is it Men in Black? No, not Men in Black. No, no, no. Yeah, I don't watch a lot of sci-fi gear. You got me yeah. there. But they, oh. they they get drunk on sour milk. You'll see like homeless rhinos on the street and shit and the alien ones got like a, a carton of milk and they're down there just get wasted a oh, carton of milk jesus oh, yeah dogs or cats Lee. Lee's an alien he could eat the hot food get some pie or something dogs or cats gary cats of course oh, oh yeah you're cat, or, I, like cat dogs, day. I like dogs with cats yeah a, a movie you could watch over and over again braveheart braveheart mel gibson huh? okay Favorite biggest b- biggest pet peeve people being late can't stand it <laughs> damn it, people are you're an on time person like me too right i'm i'm early for everything because i want to be there the minute i'm supposed to and then you're in a band with everybody who shows up at the airport fucking 10 minutes before boarding <laughs> you know we used to we used to board as a group you know we'd all get the now i don't stress anymore because they show up when they show up you know yeah you know, the check-in as a band anymore i get there i check my shit in i go through the security and go to the bar they show up when they show up so right. that, that stress is gone for me now yeah oh uh, yeah that's uh tardiness is one of my biggest pet I peeves too. Same tardiness. yeah Please. um what time does your alarm go off every morning my internal alarm in my head goes off at about three in the morning every night Jesus. I watch TV till about five, go back to sleep for a little bit. Sometimes I don't go back to sleep at all. I, I barely sleep anymore. Oh, man. That, I, that, go, I go to sleep at a decent hour, but like I've been up today since like about six, and that's sleeping in for me. Wow. Wow. Those usually, days of- usually I wake up three or four, watch a couple hours of TV, and then I'll go back to sleep for another hour. Yeah, I'm, I'm usually like a 6.37 person, so. Yeah, I got shit to do, you know, yeah. like plenty of time for sleeping when I'm dead, you know, I, I got the days going by already. Yeah. Dude, what? The time of the day is in the early morning. That's when I'll sit and watch old episodes of Game of Thrones and drink my coffee. Then I get up, once I'm up, I start doing shit. You're on the go, huh? On the go. There you go. Um, a song you love to sing when you're alone song i love to sing when i'm alone oh god that's a good one oh man <laughs> i have to think on that for a second I usually don't sing when i'm alone <laughs> Although, you're you know, probably I'm singing in your head or you're in the shower um i don't know because it changes there's no one song it's like it could be anything and it could just be the most random fucking song on earth yeah. it just gets stuck in my head you know like usually it's some old 70s song, some really cheesy song, you know, like Helen Reddy or some shit. Well, there you go. I'll take that. I thought you might say something like Prince because I know you're a big Prince oh, fan. That's, a, that's all that's in my blood. It's in my DNA. <laughs> what's your um, favorite vacation spot? Favorite, what's a vacation? Come on, man. You know. I have not had a real vacation I don't think in my whole life. I've gone to places with Lisa, you know, with my wife. And okay. then involved being on tour to get there. Well, so, yeah. Pick a place what, then. What is that? I place I love to travel to is Japan. That's my favorite place to go. Yeah, Japan's really cool. I like Japan. The food, 
just go and like drink beer and eat at like 10 different places in the same night, just stop and have some fucking gyoza and then go to another place and get some sushi and, and another beer and this walk, you know, it's so safe and everybody's so respectful and polite. I love it. Yeah, yeah. man. Then you fly home and you have a layover in Philly and <laughs> well, yeah. not, uh, just that's just kind of a what if obviously coming from japan you don't go to philly but yeah and then you encounter the real source of fucking frustration <laughs> uh what's the one thing about you that probably annoys others that one thing what one thing about you that annoys others <laughs> nothing <laughs> Come on, man. Well, my wife, what annoys her is that my hearing is bad and like I can never hear anything she says. And I'm constantly, huh? Huh? What? And that, she actually is on my shit to get a hearing aid. You getting one? I should, you know, see, I'm missing the high frequencies and, you know, female voices are higher. You know, I don't hear them. Yeah. Well, that's no wonder why, man, because nine years in Slayer would all that loudness, man. That's why your hearing's gone out, bro. Yeah. Marshall amps, monitors, everything. That's just. Funny. But uh, yeah, that, that's super annoying to her. Um, I don't know. I don't think I have really any annoying habits. I, I, I lay in my bed and watch shows in my bunk. I mean, on tour, you know, I don't. I, I give my band free reign to do what the fuck they want within reason. I'm not too annoying. Yeah, you just. I, I get what you're saying. What's your favorite smell? Favorite smell. Ah, nice steak grilling. Animal flesh. Steak. What kind of what kind <laughs> of steak? The shit smells good. And even when I wasn't eating it, it smelled good. You know? oh, dude. What's your favorite steak? It's like a ribeye. Yeah, same here. I like ribeye. Just enough fat content in it, you know. Yeah, I like ribeye, especially on a like a I like a steak sandwich. That's my thing. I don't like to chew it in the front teeth. It gets all stuck up in there, you know? Yeah, that's why you have floss, bro. I know, I know. <laughs> if you don't have floss, I'll like fucking search all my clothes for a, a thread that I can pull off to try to get in there, you know? Yeah. You gotta care. Stuck and you're fucked up. <laughs> An instrument you wish you could play? Violin. Wow. You like I the sound of violin? In cello. I've always thought about actually like trying to teach myself to play cello. Mm. Yeah, it has a nice sound to it. Violin does have a nice sound, all that orchestrated so stuff. Impressive, you know, like in piano, you know, like not keyboards, piano. I wish I could play a piano. That's yeah. where, like, you know, I listen to Prince and, you know, my favorite Prince songs are his piano songs. And I wish I could play and sing like that. Yeah, I like the sound of piano and a Hammond organ. I like those sounds. There you go. On a scale of one to five, Gary, how good of a dancer are you? Fucking ten. Oh, <laughs> sick. Especially when I was younger and all my joints worked better. I could dance, but not as good as Rick Hunolt. Not as good as Rick Hunolt. Rick That's Hunolt is a dancing machine, and I'm not saying, like, oh, he's silly. Rick Hunolt, I've seen him gather crowds around him watching him dance. I'm going to have to – I've heard – something to that effect but i i gotta i gotta see that man you know he has that ability to just cut loose no matter who how many people are watching him it's fucking badass rick you know I mean, what, did you, what did you have for breakfast today gary i had some sriracha chicken bacon sounds good and an egg uh, yeah, okay that sounds good Here's a bonus question for you. All right, bonus. Michael Schenker or Richie Blackmore? Blackmore. Blackmore? Schenker right on his heels. That's, <laughs> you know, Blackmore's my favorite guitar player, and Schenker is like my favorite guitar player. Slightly, they kind of like the racing from the finish line, they kind of like that. You know, it depends on what my mood is. You know, UFO or Rainbow, you know, or Deep Purple. Yeah, yeah. Like, I had Ricky Rackman on last week. He talked about you. And I threw him a question. I said, priest or maiden? And it was, you know, I think he was on the same thing. It's hard. Priest. Priest? Priest. Although it's a, it's a two-part question. First time I heard first Iron Maiden album was like hearing music for the first time. Yeah. But, you know, like the body of work, you know, like 
priest, you know, that's just so metal, you know, they invented the look, everything about it, you know? Yeah. Gary, thank you very much for jumping course, on this Saturday. Man. I appreciate yeah. it. And, you know, yeah, thank you. How to get my phone to work. There you go. Thanks to all the fans watching and all the fans that submitted questions. There were great questions. Yeah, Gary Stug. And um, stay tuned for the new Exodus. You said it's July release you're hoping for? June or July, I think. Um, something like that. Summer. And I'm sure there's going to be an album cover you guys going to share soon down the road. It's been worked on right now. It's pretty sick. The backdrop's going to look rad. Oh, man, I can't wait. Exodus, new record this summer. Gary, thank you again. Thanks, Ed. You fun. have a good one. I haven't seen you. I hope we can see each other soon. No, no, I hope we can see people sometime soon. All I'm right, sure. man. <laughs> yeah. All right, everyone, thanks for joining in, and I'll see you when the next stream is up.